All right, everybody, hello and welcome. We're going to get started with our webinar today. Our webinar is Shore Packaging Integration Strategies to Thrive in a Digital First World. As a reminder, you will be on mute throughout the duration of the webinar. A couple of other housekeeping items. You can drop your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save some time at the end to answer those. Additionally, a recording of the webinar will be sent on demand following the conclusion of today's session. And with that, I will pass it over to Kevin Kazemeyer, Trade Centric's VP of Channel Development, to kick us off. Kevin. Thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. As Amanda said, I'm Kevin Kazemeyer, Vice President of Channel Development here at Trade Centric. And for those of you who are not as familiar with us and what we do, we are formerly known as Punch Out to Go until we rebranded about two years ago. And we're an integration platform that connects buyers and suppliers through the procure to pay process by enabling punch out as well as automating purchase orders, invoices, and other related documents. But more about that later. Um, I'm excited to actually have the two guests here today joining me to discuss really how to thrive in a digital world by talking through some of the solutions that Shore Packaging has been able to implement to drive success. So before we get into that, let's uh, turn it over to our panel to introduce themselves. And let's start off with uh, Shane Smythe. Everyone, Shane Smythe, uh, nice to be here. Looking forward to walking through the content with you all. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Saltbox, a Salesforce implementation company. All right, welcome, Shane. And now, uh, Karen, why don't you take over? Hi, I'm Karen Carlton. I'm the Director of Salesforce Delivery at Shore Packaging. So for those of you not familiar with Shore, we are a distributor of packaging products, equipment, and services. We are a 100-year-old company, so we're moving real fast now. And uh, we're employee-owned, which is pretty exciting. And I'm happy to be here. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you both for those introductions. Um, Let's take a minute to quickly take a look at our agenda for today. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with an overview of Shore's e-commerce journey. And we'll follow that up by highlighting this phased approach and the strategies that really help drive success throughout the implementation. Uh, from there, we're gonna transition into a sort of a panel discussion. And then finally, we'll open it up for Q&A. And as a reminder, as Amanda mentioned, um, if you have a question, feel free to post it in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and we'll answer your questions during the open session. So now let's get started. So Karen, I'm gonna have you take us on a, on a little journey here and walk us through Shore Packaging's e-commerce evolution. Sure. So Shore Packaging, right, as I mentioned, we've been around for a hundred years. And during that time, there's been obviously a massive amount of technology improvements that have happened throughout the world. Uh, and one of the things a few years ago that was evaluated is, hey, we need to make sure that our systems in-house um, are kind of keeping up. So we had a number of in-house systems, um, kind of disparate, and we knew we really needed to kind of take it to the next level in order for us to meet our growth goals. Um, I've been with Shore for a year and a half, and in my interview, uh, our chief commercial officer, he explained to me kind of the plan is we're going from Flintstones to Jetsons. He's like, that's kind of what you're tasked with, right? And I loved it. And I was like, that's why you're in sales. Uh, it was a really great sound bite, but it, but it really has been true, right? So as we think about our e-commerce site, we had a homegrown system, highly customized, could do whatever we wanted, but not really scalable, right? So um, we made the decision that we were going with Salesforce is a, kind of an unrelated project. But then when we were evaluating commerce solutions, we were like, it makes sense to kind of tie these things together. So that journey kind of started in January of 22. So actually before I was here, uh, a lot happened. We got it stood up for July of 22. And then as we looked at kind of where we were going to continue to go, punch out kept coming up as something people were asking us for, right? I come from a background that is not in manufacturing. I'd never heard about punch out. I did not understand what it was. And that has been something that trade centric was great at explaining over and over to make sure we understood, <laughs> to make sure I understood. Uh, and so, you know, we, we embarked on our journey with trade centric in the fall of last year. And we have customers that are now on trade centric using punch out. And the next kind of evolution as we look at this has been automating those orders that are coming through our e-commerce site, right? So taking that information that up, up until a little bit ago was actually an email would come in saying, this is the, the confirmation of the order, but actually taking it and automating that data and that 
uh, having that order actually get fulfilled. And so that's something we've embarked on with Saltbox. Awesome. Well, that's helpful. Thank you for kind of setting the stage. And so now the way I understood it, you've kind of broken that up into these phases. And phase one is really starting off with that that e-commerce strategy. So you talked about going from Flintstones to the Jetsons. Why don't you walk us a little bit more in detail about like what happened in phase one and, and some of the, the reasons that led you down that Salesforce path? Yeah. So like I mentioned, it was we were already evaluating looking at Salesforce for our CRM. And as we looked at different commerce solutions, we knew that what we had, it was great. Again, highly customized. Um, our customers loved it, but we were really at a point where we're like, we need to pivot. We need to, to get a more scalable solution. So um, different options were evaluated, but we really kind of came back to the commerce cloud because it made sense with the broader Salesforce work we were doing. It was really important to us. It was going to be a very easy integration. Um, we do have middleware that integrates Salesforce to our ERP. So we're able to have that happen pretty naturally. Again, the scalability was huge, right? The, the homegrown solution can only get you so far. <laughs> and so being able to uh, continue to adapt leveraging Salesforce has been really important. And then the customer experience, it, it was night and day, right? So Salesforce allows you a very clear design. It's very easy. You can make it look nothing like Salesforce. There's lots, there's lots of commerce experiences out there that people don't even realize are Salesforce. Uh, and so it really allows you to, to make something very pretty. And then again, it, it ties everything together when you're looking at it from a CRM perspective that our internal employees are able to understand what is happening with the customers who are placing those orders on our site. They know where things have gone wrong, they know when an order has been placed, they know when it's shipped. They'll, they're able to start to see all of that. And not only are we able to see that internally, but the customers are also able to see that too. So it was really important to us. Awesome. So um, sounds like, you know, you really set a good foundation. What did, what were like some of the um, initial responses from your customers? Did you have to go out and pitch it to them to start buying online? Were they anxiously waiting to buy online? Or what was that reaction like? A little mixed. So we started targeting with uh, the customers who'd been using our prior commerce site. Um, and then our product owner over our e-commerce site, she's been really working very hard with our sales team to make sure they understand, here's the functionality that we have on this new site. Here's the opportunities, explaining how all of that ties together with the rest of Salesforce um, and really helping our reps target which customers make sense. We have plenty of customers who do not want to place their orders online and that's fine, right? So we're focusing on customers who have high volume orders that they just want to be able, they don't want to have to deal with us. That's great. We'll, we'll put them here. If there are customers who are, you know, a little, a little farther away from the sales rep, a little harder to get to, we kind of make sure that we're kind of driving them there, letting them understand what capabilities exist and how we can make that seamless for them. Perfect. Sounds like a great strategy. And so, you know, you started off in your, in your journey talking about, that you know you needed to know what punch out was because you were getting a lot of people asking about punch out right and so yes. you know you're not alone in learning about the basics of punch out in fact you know when we attend a lot of these b2b shows we spend most of our time at our booth having conversations about what it really is punch out i heard someone say this word punch out i don't know what it is um you know we have to first start off by saying you know it's not mike tyson it's not the old video game it's something that's actually valuable in the business world um, but with that in mind, you know, you mentioned that that was part of your next phase, right? And, and taking that phase two approach. Well, you know, as part of that, you know, we're thankful that you chose trade centric, but, you know, just to back it up a step, we actually recently launched uh, an e-commerce maturity model that kind of breaks e-commerce maturity into four dimensions, right? And it's state of your e-commerce platform and the expertise around that, uh, your business buy-in, the technical capabilities. And then the last piece was identified buyers or the demand, and do you have the demand in the market? And what we found is that most mature, successful organizations, they have a strong e-commerce system and they have a buy-in amongst the leadership, right? So it's a top-down approach. Everybody understands the value in it. And it actually sets a great foundation for a sophisticated e-commerce strategy that gives you really the ability to execute on. And so sure, you know, is clearly a leader in what you have just talked about, and the ability to now have that buy-in, have them pitching that vision. That's the reason why you chose to go there, right? And so now they're stepping up that, you know, next phase of it and becoming a leader in the integration and punch-out capabilities. So how about you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what led you down the path to picking an integration partner versus deciding it to do it on your on your own and 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 some of the other values that you've seen from integrating? 
Yeah. So I think um, the interesting thing, so the first time I heard Punch Out, I would been here literally two months, very, very new to, to all of this. And um, as we talked about it, I did learn that we did have a developer in-house who had been working, not as a full-time project, but had kind of been trying to figure out on the side how to build this. Um, there were a number of challenges that you ran into, a kind of prioritization, right? There's, I think the the thing that is really important to, to know, right, is with this punch out capability and the, the, the part that Trade Center handles is connecting to everybody else. That's where all the complexity is and not how we wanted, wanted our team spending their time, right? So we decided pretty quickly, we're like, we're gonna, we're definitely gonna wanna get a partner for this, right? We, we did some research and, you know, from talking to people and our, you know, the conversations that we had with Trade Centric, it was very clear that they were the leader uh, in the space. And again, they were very patient and just, again, explaining it to us as many times as we needed it <laughs> to make sure that we understood what pieces we were getting and when and how we were leveraging that. The other thing that I think was really great is as part of once, once we decided we were signing on with Trade Centric, right, we worked very closely with them because you know, they they knew that we had a list of customers who would come to us. They said, "Hey, let us let us look at that list of customers. We'll see who actually is already using Punch Out, right?" So it's going to be it was going to be better for us as people who are brand new to doing it, a little easier onboarding for us, uh, and and then also an easy experience because the customer already knew what was what was going to happen, right? So that has been that was something that I don't think I necessarily would have thought of or had expected as a little bit of the service provided. And I think it was something that was really, really great. But it, now that we've got punch out, right, part of that experience has been, um, and, and we had been warned about it by, by Trade Centric, is, you know, a lot of the back and forth and the whole thing is actually like the customer itself that we're working with, they're running a little hot and cold on if, if it's a priority for them, is it not, right? And, and so several of the customers that said, yes, we want to do this actually Still haven't gone live yet because it's not a priority for them right now, but we've we've gotten plenty of other customers on, so we're pretty excited. So let me build on that real quick. So um, when you talk about customer demand, you know, what I hear sometimes is that, well, I don't have anybody in that space or nobody that I'm really selling to utilizes those those systems. And people may think the industry that you're in and the fact that you're a manufacturer, well, maybe you're not uh, maybe you're not having that demand, and maybe there isn't an audience for this product. What do you say to that? Um, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's that's number one. I do think right again. Trade Centric has been really great in the partnership of of you know we at first gave them just just the list of customers who'd reached out to us and and we have we're kind of pivoting ourselves too as you talked about the maturity model right right now we've been very reactive. It's the customers asked for it. Let's get them signed up and um, from other webinars and events that you all have had, we've, we've seen other customers of yours kind of talking about how they've switched to maturing. And we, we are very quickly trying to get ourselves pivoted too, so that we're explaining to our sales teams why this is important, what to listen for when they're talking to customers. Because I think that's the other thing, right? Is that um, people may not know what to listen for because people aren't always going to explicitly say the words punch out to you. <laughs> so I think it's making sure that people understand what to listen for uh, and then, really figuring out who to target to, because now we want to get to the point where we're educating our sales team and identifying the customers we want to target. And then again, kind of similarly to what we did when we were first signing on with Trade Centric is taking it to that next level of saying, okay, here's the customers we're looking at targeting. Do any of them already leverage punch out with you? Great. Okay. That's good. I love it. I love to hear that because what ends up happening now is once you start building the demand and people start using the platform, whether it's just the the standalone commerce platform or the punch out side of the platform, you kind of now start to build a, a, a capability and now you try to figure out how do I tie the rest of this in in the back end, right? What do I do downstream to make things better, easier, more efficient? So you're know, knowing that you are now moving into phase three where there's this order management piece of it. So why don't you walk us through again why you decided to implement an OMS and what were the factors kind of surrounding the success? And then Shane, I'm going to ask you to, to join us in this conversation and, you know, tell us about the how, right? You know, once you've decided what happens next. Yeah. So we, we uh, looked at all the orders that we have come in, right? Did the classic mapping exercise. So we have all these different ways that we can get orders in all these different ways that they might get processed. We do have again, some homegrown uh, order automation, 
uh, tools that we have, but we want to get, again, wanting to make them scalable, wanting to provide that visibility into Salesforce. Um, and, and when we originally were moving to Salesforce, OMS was not actually on the radar. Um, but as, as we figured out what we want to do, where we saw real opportunities, it became very obvious this is this is a place that we could get a lot of efficiency. So we made the decision that we wanted to, to focus here. We looked at all of the order paths that we had, and we decided that with the work that we were doing with Shore Exchange, our e-commerce platform, we wanted to make sure that we were taking those orders since they're already in they're already starting in Salesforce and taking it kind of the rest of the way through the journey and then over to our ERP. So we're able to take those orders. Um, we've started off with some very light rules to start, right? But we're going to continue to add complexity, continue to layer in all those different um, order paths that we have so that we can start to see reduction in order entry errors, the number of inbound service requests because a customer got something wrong because there was an order entry error. And then also there's financial impact when those things go wrong. Awesome. So, so Shane, you know, um, or let me ask you, Karen, first, you know, you, you made all these decisions around order management. What led you then to try to think about, I can't do this myself, right? So just like previously with the punch out, you, how did you decide that order management was not something to do alone? So I think, A, it's mainly, so we'd at least heard of that one. Uh, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> so the, the thing that was really important to us was, we wanted to get it right. And so order management, right? It's depending upon who you're talking to, right? It, it is somewhat newer to the Salesforce space kind of as it's branded, but the, the functionality and the technology behind it itself isn't, right? So we knew that it was solid technology. And again, we really wanted to make sure that we had it built in and that we were thinking through everything pretty thoughtfully. And so as we talked to Saltbox, um, actually even before we established it with Saltbox, we were looking at, we had a, a vendor that we'd worked with in the past to help stand up kind of the rest of our, our Salesforce instance. Um, they're really good. Um, and we, and it was a really big debate because we kind of did, we had a few companies that we were looking at. We did in the end really narrow it down to the, the incumbent that we were working with and with Saltbox. And it, it, it was a really intense discussion because we had a company that knew a lot about us. They understood who we were, how we work, what was important to us. Um, and they had some OMS experience, but it, it just wasn't quite as deep as what Saltbox had. And it was clear Saltbox had an understanding of what we wanted, where we were trying to go. And we're, we're really pleased with that partnership because as we've, even, you know, early on in the project, we are like, Ooh, here's the thing we need to think about. That's not related to this explicit part of the project. It's more of a, a broader strategic decision. And we we came up with a plan, we ran it by them and said, does this make sense? And they they kind of helped say, you know, guide us on places where maybe that doesn't make sense, think about this. And that's been really great because that was stuff that we wouldn't necessarily have known ourselves. Uh, and I think that's been their, their knowledge in the space and what's possible and making sure we understood what was possible has been invaluable. Okay. So Shane, why don't you pick it up from there? So you were chosen. <laughs> What happens next? Well, I don't know if I could add any more to that. That was a great uh, tee up to that. <laughs> Appreciate the uh, the compliments. No, um, you know, order management is one of those applications that it is amazing the flexibility you can manage, and and really the way that it was it was built was to be flexible with business process. I mean, if you think about it, the order management capability, how you accept orders, and what you do with it is the center of your business. I mean, how you structure this is really going to uh, influence, you know, down, downstream things like fulfillment and the customer's experience and uh, reordering capability and, and much, much more. And so making sure that you are uh, applying the flexibility in the right spots, but building a, a foundation lets you scale and modify in the future is really important for projects like this. Um, so yeah, the, the team I think has, has done a, a really good job collectively between, you know, Softbox and, and Shore to build out this foundation that lets us, uh, introduce some of this capability right away to drive a lot of really good uh, performance and, and capabilities right out of the gate, but set that foundation up to continue to build onto it in the future. And, you know, uh, we can, we can go into this and, in, you know, I think in the panel discussion and later, but, you know, doing that incremental approach is really, really important, especially in the order management space. 
Uh, so yeah, we, we've had a, a ton of fun uh, with the short team building out this platform to, to really help them uh, drive the right performance for everyone. Great. Well, thanks for that overview. And, um, you know, appreciate both of you sharing a little bit about what has happened in these phases. And before we really jump into the panel and, and transition into that panel discussion, I just want to bring up something, Shane, that that I've had exposure to and I've seen in the past. And I know Saltbox has, you know, their own perspective on the evolution of e-commerce and order management and where it comes along in the steps of the maturity or of a, of a customer's commerce maturity. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of take us through a little bit about your maturity ladder and, and talk to you about where OMS fits in, in in the whole scope of things. Yeah, that sounds great. You know, um, everyone has a little bit different version of a maturity ladder. And in our book, when it comes to the commerce maturity ladder and, and how do you build a platform that scales and identify the right solutions that help you accelerate your business, we kind of think it have been three different tiers here. We've got our foundational that sets that the groundwork for you to really start ingesting orders and bringing a digital presence to your consumers and your internal users. Things like, you know, experience cloud and sales cloud service um, are, are some of the, the areas that companies typically start. Um, and one of those things is typically commerce cloud, right? You're bringing in that digital presence, that order ordering capability for your end consumers. And once you have that foundation, uh, typically companies will move into kind of this differentiated uh, tier phase here. And that's when you start introducing things like order management and, um, you know, Caveo potentially and other tools uh, but this really gives you that centralized place that you're not just talking about a single order stream from commerce anymore. You're talking about multiple orders uh, from different locations, right? We, and we were just kind of talking about that in the last slide there. But, um, you know, orders from the commerce store, obviously orders from other uh, locations like, you know, email could be through Trade Centric, it could be through other partners as well. And starting to have a full holistic view of the orders and the ability to manage those and have a good experience uh, for your end consumers. And then you move more into this innovative uh, tier that we're talking about here, where you start to connect more of the dots in this experience and starting to derive um, much more better, uh, much better experience through personalization and communication with marketing cloud, data cloud activities uh, for recurring and notifications and, and you know, even going into uh, 3D kits and other things of that nature if your industry, um, if it makes sense in your industry. So I think this this uh, maturity ladder here really helps focus on what matters most at what phases in your business. So if you can kind of think about it from that lens, you know, you kind of want to identify where am I at in my business and what makes the most sense for us to start to build that foundation to kind of step, uh, step between uh, the foundational and innovative uh, side. Well, great. I, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think this is uh, just just showing that you're thinking of all the, the the paths to success for your clients and implementing different ways to, uh, again, add on different features to drive the functionality and what the end customer really needs, I think, is, is very valuable. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so now I'm going to take uh, probably about the next 15 minutes to dive a little deeper into what we just reviewed. Um, I'm going to have a panel discussion with, with Shane and Karen and ask them some of my questions that I've put together because, uh, hey, you know what, we uh, learned a lot from them, but now we want to dig just a little bit deeper. And then after that, we will open it up for Q&A. So let's start off with uh, Karen. So, so Karen, you told us that um, Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, you know, it was your chosen uh, platform, right? And, you know, what I want to know and I want to understand was how did that platform set a, a, a solid foundation for advancing shore packaging's, not only your maturity, right? But how did you success, how did it successfully put you on the right path to drive the next phase of your e-commerce strategy? So I think it's been the, you know, it's, it's similar to, to kind of everything we're talking about, we did, we're kind of doing everything with phased approaches, right? But we did have uh, an element of, since we had a prior site that existed for e-commerce, we really needed to make sure that we were able to have comparable functionality, right? There are some pieces that we decided we're not gonna go forward with this yet. So um, there are things that we are continuing. We have a very robust backlog of, of things we wanna do, but I think getting the, getting Salesforce in there and having it start to tie to, again, the rest of the pieces of Salesforce has been 
critical and the education with our sales team and, and starting to make sure our customers understand what's available um, has been really great. The other thing that we do, right, we have catalogs that are specific to our customers. We do have other um, in-house products that we're able to, to sell um, to them. We are also um, incidentally partnering with Saltbox uh, on some improvements to our commerce website, right? And it, that's, um, that's part of Part of why we chose them too is we we also had um, the we, we no longer have a relationship with the company that we had uh, that implemented our e-commerce site, um, but we we still need some deep expertise there, and that was something else we were able to leverage with them. And so as we think about the the places we want to continue to grow there, we've um, again even the the consultative nature of we said here are the things that we know these are our top priorities of the next things we want to do for our e-commerce site um one of them is that we do need to move off of aura onto the, the lwr framework right and so that was part of the discussion with salt boxes what makes sense to do now versus what do we need to wait and do and so that was a, a really great discussion because they were able to say we we wouldn't do this now um but i think that we've been able to identify the things that are going to help drive revenue um to to that that site and able to, again then now that we're automating those orders now it's going to make that all happen a lot faster okay so follow up to that which i'm sure is on everybody's mind is did you experience hurdles throughout this journey and 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 if so what were they and how did you overcome them of course we did um i think a, a lot of it candidly when the the website itself was being built right the, the salesforce team basically had one person on it and it was not a leader it was a, it was a um business analyst slash senior level admin and um i think she experienced a lot of challenges making sure that her voice was heard the partner was listening but i think there were other uh people overwriting her from, from an internal perspective. So that was, I think, a bit of a challenge. We do have a little bit of tech debt as a result of some of that that we're working through. Um, I think because we had that prior site that we were trying to get parity with, that was a, a source of friction for some of the discussions of what are we what are we making sure that we're actually bringing in? What is nice to have? We, we want to get this out more quickly. So that was part of it. Um, and as we think about the Kind of thinking about it in all facets right so that's kind of from the e-commerce perspective from the trade centric perspective right with getting punch out set up um again it's a lot of hurry up and wait with some of the the customers we're working with right so we you know the processes is we do testing with trade centric to make sure that our commerce site and trade centric work together cleanly and then you know there's random little battles once you get the, <laughs> the customer involved on the the punch out side um and those i think are all standard and to be expected and different every time too, as you engage those customers, depending upon which ERP they've got. Uh, and then on the OMS side, right, we, I, I think there were some philosophical discussions that we should have had before we started our, our first phase of our project, but we, we got through those. And I think with that so far, I think we've done it right kind of to what Shane was saying about the fact that we're, we're being really mindful of how we're incrementing that work because the rules around, you know, your orders can be infinitely complex, right? Uh, and so we're we're making sure that we're starting with like small rules and we'll continue to iterate there. Um, and I think it's just really making sure that everybody's on the same page. There is also an element of everybody's favorite change management too, right? Uh, a lot of people are very much, you know, my job is. I enter these orders and I'm like, I want your job to be, to think about other things that, you know, that we need a, a human to do and, and let the, let the system do what systems do and let you as a human do the things that you need to do, not just rekey things. So, but, but that's, that is hard for everybody. Right. So. Yep. That's a great point. Cause that was my follow-up. I was about <laughs> to say, so tell me about in change management because it had to be rampant throughout the organization. Yes, and wow. and that's the thing, right? Is that with it with a full scale Salesforce implementation, there's a lot. So it involves constant communication, constant follow up. There's um, really great, like our, our executive team is very much leading by example. There are things that our our chief commercial officer has, but he's made sure he's really trained and understands as much as he can about what's going on within our Salesforce environment. So that you know, whenever somebody's like, oh well, blah blah blah, you know not related to this, but an example of 
why isn't the opportunity closed? And the person said, whatever. And he's like, okay, pulled out his phone and he's like, okay, it's closed now. I closed that opportunity for you. <laughs> right. So there's, there's an element of the, the executive team is a hundred percent behind this and they realize that's where we've got to go. Um, and it really is just making sure that that people are comfortable and understanding what their concerns are too, because they, they are the ones to understand the complexity of all these rules of how orders get filled or how things happen and making sure that, that we're listening to them and addressing their concerns um, and, and not just glossing over it too. That's very important. Great. Thanks. That was, uh, it was really, really detailed and I love it. Um, so Shane, you know, knowing it's beneficial to find a partner to help you implement a full suite of products from a platform like uh, Salesforce, right? And knowing and hearing what Karen had just talked to us about all of their requirements that they had in finding a partner, what are some factors that organizations should be considering when selecting a partner to stand up something like as big as an order management system? Yeah, uh, really good question. I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack in there, and I'll, I'll try to summarize in a, a couple of, of bullets here. Um, I think the first one is you got you need to find someone who has expertise in and the platform and also expertise in the industry, right? Every industry and every uh, company handles orders a little bit differently. So finding a company who, you know, has that exp experience there, but then knows the platform really well, knows the ins and outs, knows uh, how to flex, uh, flex and customize where you need to and where not to as well, uh, I, I think is a really important factor in, you know, how to choose that partner. Uh, that's that's coming in to help kind of build that platform out uh, because you're you're building that foundation like we talked about. So you want to make sure it's solid and and you can grow from it. I think another thing to keep in mind is um, finding someone who is focused on the user's experience. Um, and when I say that, it's not just the end consumer that you're showing you know an, an order to or allowing them to purchase, but it's also the internal user as well. How do you make that experience really slick and easy um, without you know, having them do a, a cumbersome order process every single time they want to make a modification. So finding that balance between flexibility and, and uh, intuitive user experience is, is really important, keeping that focus throughout the experience. I think the, the last one I, I'll mention is having the long view in mind, right? It's, you know, relatively easy to set up a platform for what you know today. It's uh, a little bit more challenging to set something up that will allow you to flex and scale with what we know is going to be coming around phase two and phase three. And you know, Karen mentioned a couple of times that being able to kind of take the, uh, the requirements and identify what do we do now? What do we do later? How do we implement this so that we're not you know, backing ourselves into a corner when we want to go and add X, Y, and Z uh, into the future? And just you know, keeping in mind things like scale and performance and some of those other things uh, will really help differentiate the solution that uh, comes out at the end of that project. Yeah, so I think that focus on end users experience is important because I think it talks to this the change management piece that Karen mentioned as well, right? And and how important that is across the organization to make things easy to use as much as it is easy to deploy and and provide to your end customers. So um so 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 Karen, Shane also just said having the 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 long view in mind, right? And that goes to like the the vision and it's obvious that, you know, unlike some other organizations that at short packaging, you're looking at continuing improving and building a found building on this foundation that that you started, right? And providing your customers with everything they need to make buying from you as easy as possible. So with that in mind, you know, what advice could you give to other organizations who are looking to advance their e-commerce maturity? Like where should they begin? Where should they start? And what should they be looking at? first, right? Yeah, I think, you know, like I mentioned, there's tons, tons and tons of things in our backlog. And there are tons of ways we, we could have gone about this. And I think that it you do really have to just take a beat, think about everything that needs to get done um, that you're aware of. And I think to Shane's point, trying to kind of see into the future in a way that you may not be able to, <laughs> but doing your best, right? Uh, and figuring out what is really going to drive the business forward? What are the biggest things that are going to have the biggest impact, right? When we're assessing the projects that we're going to work on, we look at the impact and we look at the, the expected effort, right? And just because something is a high, a high doesn't mean that it won't get done. We just 
go in eyes wide open to it, right? And so making sure that we understand what that benefit is going to be. Um, we are also uh, pretty, pretty diligent with our uh, business partners too, to make sure that they, when they're asking for something from us, that they're providing us what the expected ROI is, right? And we do hold them accountable to kind of measuring to make sure that we, we are hitting that ROI. I think that's really important because a lot of people, um, I think are like, oh, this would be great. And, and they don't really think about, well, how actually beneficial is it given everything else that you have to work on? Um, and, and candidly, right, like we, when we started with this, we, our idea was we have these order paths, we want to kind of chip away at the order paths, right? Um, and in the past couple of weeks, we're like, okay, that was our approach. That's what we think makes sense. And now we're like, does it make sense to chip away at some more of the rules before we start adding in more order paths? Like, so those are some of the discussions that we're having, um, things we'll talk to talk talk to Saltbox about as we get through those to be like, d which way it kind of makes sense for us to continue as we move forward. So I think it's just constant dialogue, constant evaluation of what you're doing. And I think staying in lockstep with all the partners around you to make sure that, that you know, I think I'm going to advance this here, but that you're not accidentally stepping on the toes of something else you've done too. So I think it's making sure that you have that open communication. Yeah, and it sounds like constant collaboration with your partner and bouncing ideas off them is, is really helpful. Yeah. So keeping with the theme of sharing recommendations, Shane, can you share some of the best practices that maybe you brought to the Shore team as they implemented order management? Yeah, sure can. So I think the first one I'll start with is, I'm going to start with the theme of unified data model here. Because I, you know, when it comes down to how you implement an application, especially something like order management, it comes down to what information you have available and, and where is it coming from? So I know as we you know went throughout this implementation process with Shore, we, we were asking some questions around, you know, where is the data coming from? What are the order sources? And how do we create this unified data model? And there were some conversations about how do we how do we change and flex and who owns data from the different teams within the organization. Um, so I think that's a it's a really important thing as you're going through here is identifying that that structure of how you plan to uh, handle orders both now and in the future, um, and you know in some cases asking the hard questions both internally and 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 kind of defining you know what what does that future vision look like that we can uh, upheld and, and scale um, into the future. I think the second one and Karen's mentioned it a few times at this point already, but uh, the iterative approach. Right, it's almost never beneficial to do a big bang. Right, you want to start with that foundation, really build the, the unified data model I just talked about, define the business processes, uh, release some value to the customer internally, externally um, in that initial release. Uh, you know, in in Shore's case, you know, it was integrations, there was several uh, actions for those service reps, and and more on top of that, and then that lays the foundation to really give you incremental value each time you you continue to en enhance the platform and and start to make things easier and, and more flexible. Um, so I, yeah, I think those are the two themes I'd focus on when you're looking at an implementation like order management. Okay, so you know you, you, you speak about the iterative approach and I think that iterative approach kind of ties into your maturity model a bit as well, right? And so yeah. when I look at the phases, sure kind of launch punch out, maybe before OMS and yet you're actually pitching to even think about it, right? Which a lot of people don't. A lot of people just dismiss e-procurement, they dismiss punch out, but you're calling it out in your maturity model. So where does punch out fit in in the scope of things? And what else do you do to help prepare your clients for growth after they've launched e-com uh, platform? Yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, it really comes down to the to you know the business a bit. What's the the focus, and where are the the most amount of orders coming from, and the most amount of ROI going to to be achieved? And you know, show, for instance, uh, did something like trade centric before doing order management, and that's not necessarily a bad thing by any means, uh, even if it's a little different than what our maturity uh, ladder says. It really comes down to those requirements that are going to to make the most uh, impact there. And to answer your second question about you know, identifying that, it, it goes back to what I was saying uh, before about having that long vision or long view in mind. Um, you know, even before we go in and implement a commerce solution, 
we're asking questions. We're, we're trying to feel out where, where are we going to be going, not just in this project, but two or three projects down the line so that we have an understanding of how to, to build that unified data model and, and help build the right experience that, like I, like I said, can flex and scale. Uh, and then the decisions you make after you have that initial setup is going to be a lot easier to bring something in that will allow you to, to go to the next step like in order management or trade centric or something um, else outside of that. Okay, so constantly looking at evolution and what's gonna benefit your customer and understanding their business. I think that that's huge, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So Karen, let me come back to you on, on one. And, and this is something that I've experienced a lot more recently in, in talking with the buyer side or the customer side of the equation. And, you know, customers, they're, they're looking for suppliers that can provide them the least amount of friction and the, the shortest amount of steps in the entire procure to pay process. And so, you know, you started off with punch out, you're doing some things to benefit internally, you know, your process with order management, but, you know, invoicing is another area that comes up as a hot topic. And I've heard a lot of suppliers say, I'm just going to send them a PDF and they'll be happy with it. Right. And, and figure out how to deal with it from there. So where does something like invoicing factor into your overall e-commerce strategy? So it's it's something that we haven't necessarily put a ton of thought into yet. But as we've been thinking about the the capabilities that Trade Centric offers, right? There's there's more beyond just the punch out. There's the PO piece, the invoice, and so it's something that we are we're listening to our customers to make sure that we are providing them the pieces that they want. There's huge benefits to having it all tied together from an internal standpoint, and obviously to our customers too. So it's very clear to them. Um, kind of start to finish how easy it is to do business with Shore. Um, again, we haven't gotten too far into that discussion, but it's definitely on our radar. All right, perfect. Well, thanks for you know entertaining me and uh, answering my questions. And so um, at this time, Amanda, I think let's open it up for a Q and A if we have any in the queue. Sure. All right, so the first question that we have is for Kevin. And it says, uh, once you've got the back end order management automated, what are other options to automate orders? Okay, um, good question. I didn't know I was gonna get one too. Uh, <laughs> so I would say um, automating your purchase orders and invoices are really the, the, the next best steps to, to take in this process. And it not only makes the, the ordering faster and more efficient, but it also reduces the order processing time and costs around it. And I think people kind of sort of look past that and just think I could throw bodies at it a lot, but really it makes it not only easy for you internally, but it also makes it easier for your customers to reconcile invoices and Ultimately, it accelerates the order to cash cycle. So I think anytime you can remove manual steps from the process and reduce friction within your customer's ordering process, you're gonna see results not only in your customer satisfaction, but also in the bottom line. Awesome. Right, our next question is for Karen, and it's how was your experience implementing Salesforce from the ground up? Uh very cool in a lot of ways, right? Because you don't really get the opportunity to do that. Uh, the company I was at had it for, they got it in 2005. So it was, you know, it was old by the time I even got involved in it. So it, it is a wild to be involved from the ground up. So you get to help prevent a lot of mistakes that you maybe made in the past <laughs> or things that you know could change. Um, so it's it's been really interesting. The other thing that is great too is because there's so much opportunity to improve processes um, within Shore and and take things that are have historically been done manually, it's it's just it's great to see how how you do. Even though again the change is hard, but how much you are able to actually improve the work lives of people when they're like, oh, I don't have to do that thing anymore because the system is just doing it for me, right? And so it's really. Um, it's been really interesting because it, it also, you know, just challenges you as, as a person and the assumptions that you're making too, because as you know, a lot of people have asked us to, you know, I think they think like, I'll take this process, it's a manual process and I'll have you put it in Salesforce and we'll automate it. And I'm like, 
but it's a bad process to begin with, right? So it has, we're constantly challenging and like, is that the right process? Should we be doing it that way? And and that's actually um, something that, that Saltbox has been doing with us too, is uh, as we're in this project, right? They're making sure that we're thinking through the implications to the business process, not just you know, the actual, okay, well, the order is going to be automated now. And to the, to the point about what that employee experience is like, it's okay. This is now, this person is now going to be impacted, right? We focus on their personas and, and making sure we understand what those changes are. And so I think that's been something that, that Saltbox has really kind of kept us honest on it a couple, a few times where we probably would have not thought of it. <laughs> Great. And this one is sort of a follow up to that, Karen, and it's now that you've gotten past some of the big milestones, what would you have done differently? Hmm. Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know if there's a, a, there's definitely things we would have done differently. Fortunately, nothing hugely significant. I think the one thing that I would say hugely significant before I got here is I do think um, there should have been a little more focus on actually getting a Salesforce team in place before implementing Salesforce. So you had people... <laughs> actual shore employees uh, helping make some of those decisions because uh, I think the, the one person on the team was put in a kind of a bad place. Uh, and, and there are repercussions to that decision. Uh, I think the things that we would have probably focused on more too is just making sure that we really um, were targeting our internal messaging about why we're doing things. I think, you know, change management is always hard. It's always some communication is it's always constant, right? And there's always ways to do it better. And and that's the thing that, you know, it's, it's, it's the hardest piece of it. Like really putting the technology, making the technology do what you need it to do is actually the easier part because it doesn't have feelings. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that makes it, makes it easier. So I think just making sure that people really understand the benefits, the why, and keeping that focused. Great. Thanks, Karen. This is a question for either uh, Shane or Kevin. I think this is a this is a good one. What does success really mean when it comes to an integrated commerce experience? It seems like it could mean so many different things. What does good look like? You want to take that first, Shane? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer that. Uh, to to the question's point, there this could mean a lot of different things uh, in an organization. So I'll give you some of my thoughts, and we'll. Uh, if Kevin, you have anything to add here. When I think a integrated experience, I'm thinking integrated with the your ecosystem's worth of information. So that could mean having an integrated solution with your ERP so that when the user places the order, they can see when it's shipped and fulfilled on the commerce experience. It could also mean that you are having an integrated or connected experience with the, the other applications that are available um, for let's say Shore, for example, uh, and we, we have a connected experience with Marketing Cloud where you're getting communications afterwards, you're getting reminders, or uh, you're getting you know notified when actions need to be taken inside of the, the storefront. It could also um, mean that you're you're having a you know connected or integrated experience with some of the other you know applications like personalization on the, the site, so you know what to order and what's coming up next. Um, so. The, the questions uh, I think point on that it, it could mean a lot of different things, but um, you got to just look at your your ecosystem and what data information is available and understand how to appropriately connect all of those to really have a good experience. So I would add to that from a integrated e-commerce and you know offering it outward to customers, right? So. You know, Shane talks about internal systems, and I'm going to talk about now connecting to your customer systems. I think successful organizations, they have that solid e-commerce foundation that is capable of supporting integration, is capable of supporting punch out. Um, they're also able to identify target buyers as candidates for integration. So they have a they have a, a laundry list of, of, of people that are ready, willing, and able. Um, they can articulate the value of integration that um, can help them increase, increase adoption and drive more awareness and also allow them to access new markets, right? Um, and then finally, I think, you know, and, and selfishly for probably Shane and myself, they don't do it alone, right? They, they leverage an expert in the space and someone that has a deep understanding of commerce, e-procurement, ERP, right? I feel like 
that's that's key here because the time that you can invest in this on your own um, versus leveraging a, a partner is is priceless. Awesome, thank you for that. We've got another question, and it's we haven't yet moved to Salesforce Lightning. Will Punch Out still work for us? Um, I I can answer that because I'm the Punch Out. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so basically. You know, trade centric, we support all of Salesforce frameworks. So whether it's LWR or Aura or Headless in, in even any custom flavor of that to that matter, right? Um, we're kind of experts in this space and what we do. And we have an amazing delivery team that actually helps our customers and SIs like Saltbox that, you know, to make these connections as seamless as possible and with very little uh, lift. Great. All right, that is all of our questions. So thank you, Karen, Shane, and Kevin for your insights today. For our audience members, if you'd like to discuss more, feel free to connect with our panelists via LinkedIn. I've dropped the links to their profiles in the chat, so feel free to check those out. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.